Hello, welcome to November's ECR Wednesday webinar hosted by eLife. This series aims to give early career researchers a platform to discuss issues important to you and your research career. The session is being recorded and we'll make it available on YouTube in the near future. Now, it's my pleasure to invite Carolina Casada, a member of the eLife Early Career Advisory Group, to introduce today's session and our panelists. Uh, thank you, Jane, and hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining our ECR Wednesday webinar discussing In Pursuit of More Equitable Funding. My name is Carolina Quesada, and I'm a member of the eLife Early Career Advisory Group. I will be moderating this webinar. Um, eLife is a nonprofit organization that is operating a platform to improve all aspects of research communication by encouraging and recognizing the most responsible behaviors in research. Um, the role of the Early Career uh, Advisory Group, ECAG, is to influence and support eLife's work to catalyze broad reform in the evaluation and communication of science, and in particular, to represent the needs and aspirations of researchers at early stages in their careers for a research culture that is healthy for science and for scientists. Uh, the ECR Wednesday webinar series is just one of the initiatives that Eli has launched to help support uh, the ECR community. Uh, today, our speakers will discuss the challenges faced by early career applicants and scientists from specific geographies or underrepresented communities uh, when pursuing funding opportunities. We will also explore examples of funding policies and community initiatives that they think could help make funding fairer. Uh, the webinar will begin with the panelists sharing their stories. And uh, then in the second half of the webinar, we'll be putting your questions to them. To ask a question, you can type your question into the Zoom chat box, or you can tweet us. Uh, we are at eLife Community using uh, ECR Wednesday hashtag. Uh, I would like to welcome our three speakers. We have with us Lottie Davinde from Amsterdam University Medical Center in the Netherlands. Hugo Cariñano from the National Institute of Agricultural Technology in Argentina, Katie Grogan from the University of Cincinnati in USA. Thank you all so much for joining us today. And before opening the floor to our speakers, please follow us on Twitter at ELF Community and with the hashtag ECR Wednesday. Please uh, be respectful, honest, inclusive, accommodating, appreciative, and open to learning from everyone else. Do not attack, demean, disrupt, harass, or threaten others, or encourage such behavior. If you feel uncomfortable or unwelcome on any of these webinars, please contact eLife by email to events at eLifesciences.org. This inbox is being watched by Anya Stars eLife. Uh, we reserve the right to ask anyone to leave and or to deny access to a subsequent webinar. Uh, need help? Uh, send a, a chat message directly to eLife staff, Anya Stairs, or Chain Asso. To ask questions, use the Zoom chat box and tweet at eLife Community ECR Wednesday at any point during the webinar. Uh, I will read uh, out your name and question in the 15 minutes Q&A at the end of the webinar. Now, to introduce our speakers, um, up first is Lotte de Binde, ECAC member and leading the FAIR funding initiative within ELIF's ambassador program. Lotte will uh, highlight key information and opportunities she and her peers recently summarized in a white paper entitled Towards Inclusive Funding Practices for Early Career Researchers. Please, Lotte. Thank you, Carolina, and uh, welcome everyone to this uh, ECR Wednesday webinar. Um, next slide, please. So, um, as Carolina introduced uh, me, I am Lotte de Winde, and um, for the past two, two and a half years, I have been leading uh, one of the initiatives within the eLife Community Ambassadors Program. Uh, we called this the FAIR Funding Initiative, and our goal was to um, uh, identify uh, good practices uh, in research funding policies uh, which uh, may benefit uh, early career researchers 
um, and also to investigate um, yeah, problems within, within the current funding uh, landscape that may uh, hamper or, um, to get funding for or ECRs to get funding. So uh, we recently uh, wrote all our uh, investigations and discussions in this, uh, in this uh, preprint, which is now uh, available at OSF uh, preprints. Um, and here with, I would like, also like to thank all the co-authors for all their hard work and the, and the good uh, and nice discussions we had over the past two years. So uh, now I would like to, to summarize for you uh, our, our findings, our discussions, and also to give you some uh, ideas of, of what you could do. Um, next slide, please. So first of all, why is it important for early career researchers to obtain uh, research funding? We are, of course, as early career researchers, we're quite a broad group. So this may be uh, less important or far uh, at the horizon for you when you are a starting PhD student. However, when you uh, progress through your academic career and you become a, a senior PhD or final year PhD student, postdoc, or even when you really want to make this transition towards um, an early career uh, uh, PI, uh, principal investigator, this is, it's really important to obtain research uh, funding because it will show your uh, independence within academia. So it shows you have, uh, you are building your research focus into new questions and new ideas. Um, and also research actually has shown that it's not a prerequisite uh, to have obtained independent research funding to obtain a faculty position. However, uh, it turned out from a study uh, in the USA that that was actually turned out to be an advantage to have, to have obtained a research funding uh, if you were applying for a faculty position. So, and that's probably due to, to the, um, the things I just said about that, that you show that you have independence, that you can develop your own research ideas. So to progress in an academic career, it's really important to obtain research funding. Next slide, please. However, unfortunately, it's also very difficult for ECRs to obtain research funding. And uh, some of the hurdles that we've identified is that actually there has been over the last few, few years, a, a global decrease in research funding. In almost all countries uh, are investing less in research funding, uh, at least compared to the number of researchers. Um, there, maybe they are becoming more researchers. Um, and also the age of which um, um, starting PIs get their own research funding and can actually start their own research group has actually increased. Um, also, as a postdoc, and I, I'm also speaking from my own experience, uh, postdocs are often put on, on very short-term contracts for maybe two, three years. And nowadays, it's quite difficult to get this a uh, really solid story uh, published uh, within those two, three years, and then also develop your own research ID away from your main supervisor. So actually this, this whole process uh, takes a couple more years and therefore you end up doing multiple postdoctoral positions. Then also ECRs face uh, poor mentorship, challenges in publishing, uh, restrictive grant funding criteria. I will come to that uh, later. Um, and unfortunately also biases in grant review. And then if you have applied for grants and you get a negative result, there is often a lack of feedback and transparency to learn from this process and to know where you need to improve your, um, um, yeah, your research proposal or maybe your CV. And most importantly, I think this is not really a general, some of these teams may apply to some of us, but not to all of us. So there's really a difference. Uh, for example, if you're a woman, you will have uh, less um, chances of obtaining research funding. And also if you are from a country with uh, less research funding or less well-known, uh, or if you uh, have done a PhD or a postdoc in a less known uh, laboratory, these are all things that really influence if you uh, become successful in obtaining research funding. Next slide, please. So 
already here, I come to our recommendations and I don't have enough time to, to go into de uh, detail for all of them. Um, but yeah, you can, read, you can read more in our preprint. But it's really important for an early career researcher is of course the number of funding opportunities. And if those funding opportunities are really uh, for your uh, specialism or your, uh, yeah, at, at your stage in your career, and um, maybe you're thinking about um, starting a family or maybe you already have kids. So you're also think it's important uh, if, if parental leave is taken in color, into consideration and if that stops having, uh, if, if that really means a break within your research funding or that you can maybe substitute uh, that with, with a technician. Um, eligibility time, a lot of um, uh, um, research, um, sorry, funding organizations, at least in the UK, for example, have now, uh, they don't look at, at your eligibility time. So the time, number of years after your PhD that you can apply for a certain postdoctoral fellowship. Um, because every one of us will have a different career and we will be ready to apply for the postdoctoral fellowship at a certain time. Nationality, uh, especially in the US, it turns out that for a lot of funding, you need to be a US citizen, uh, especially uh, PhD applications. So um, that's an important point. And also scholarly outputs. I mean, we all publish papers because uh, that's our, our end result of our research. However, we also maybe uh, make codes or we uh, do public engagement or we do other things like being an eLife ambassador. So those are all things that are important for us as early career researchers as well. Well, and then um, we have proposed uh, things that a funder can improve. Uh, consider the biases, I will come back to that later. Uh, encourage co-applications of early career researchers on grants because that will show a little bit of independence and building research focus. Expand the citizenship criteria. Fund fundamental research. A lot of, re uh, a lot of um, funding organizations, and especially also charities, which are linked to a certain disease, are moving into more funding more translational research. However, we need this fundamental research to then get new questions uh, that to, to feed this translational research. Preliminary applications can be really important um, because it will give you very quick uh, result of if your research proposal or if you're uh, are at the right time in your career, uh, parental leave, I've discussed that, encourage preprints, um, evaluate applicants on a need basis, not because they're from a very famous laboratory, but which maybe is already very rich, but actually because this research uh, environment is less uh, wealthy and therefore there is not a lot of resources. Um, and then um, this remove time after PhD restrictions, I talked about that. And also I will, I will come back in detail about the use of alternative funding mechanisms. Next slide, please. So first biases. I think during all our discussions, we found that the actually biases in um, grant review is maybe one of the biggest challenges that ECRs and actually uh, a, a lot of minorities in science face uh, when their grants are reviewed. Um, and well, you, you can all identify uh, or probably acknowledge the importance of, of, these, of these biases and, and why we shouldn't have them. But there's actually one I would like to uh, emphasize a bit more because maybe not all of you will think about it and they are familiar. Uh, next slide. Disability. Uh, so some of us have done a little bit of research into what's out there for people with a disability. Um, and maybe you're not aware or maybe you will get a colleague who's not aware. So that's why I wanted to highlight it today. So there's actually an organization called Chronically Academic that has a lot of research and also really advocating for people with a disability. Also several funding organizations actually offer or are looking into offering paid medical leave in case you yeah, have to go to the hospital or you're out of, you cannot do your job for a couple of weeks or months. Um, and there is a new one, which is really in this um, COVID pandemic, we see all these uh, uh, funding opportunities arise. And there's actually one from the Canadian 
uh, national educational associations of disabled students that's offering emergency support for students with disabilities in response to COVID-19. However, this is kind of all what we found. So it's actually really not a lot. And um, I don't know if you know, but I don't know a lot of disabled uh, scientists. So it would be great if more attention will be paid to this group. Next slide, please. And then alternative funding mechanisms. So some of us have looked at this. Uh, and one that maybe you have all heard or are familiar with, this is high risk, high gain funding. Um, which is really nice. It's small pots of funding. You don't need a lot of preliminary data and more and more funding, uh, funding organizations are offering such a scheme now. Then there have also been some trials with lottery-based funding in which in a first round, there's really a, people will look at if your uh, project is, is available for, or suitable for funding. And then in a second round, there will be a lottery drawn. So the chances of getting the funding is actually equal and you rule out this, this uh, implicit bias in the second round. Then crowdfunding, which is maybe not a very a big thing and very sustainable. Um, but actually, I also know of some, uh, some examples of people that have used crowdfunding to fund their research. And then there is this last, uh, very recent, so it's not in our preprint, uh, initiative of the Dutch Royal Academy of Sciences that uh, have now put a proposal together for the Dutch government to implement a rolling grant fund in which if you become an assistant professor, you will get 250,000 euros. Um, and every uh, step you go up the ladder, you will get 125,000 euros more um, as a start. So which you can use for your research to hire a PhD student or to buy some equipment. So you actually, get that money uh, to, to promote your, your own research and you don't have to put a lot of time and investment in writing a grant. So I thought that was a really new out of the box innovative idea and I'm very curious to see what will happen with this in the future. Next slide, please. So this is my last slide um, and I thought I will tell you what I think you could do with the information we have put together. And I think first of all, of course, um, is that you can share our preprint because it's really something like this. And I'm not saying that to tap myself on the shoulder, but it's really a an, an very extensive uh, document of, of everything that's been done for early career researchers and to promote uh, or yeah, to have um, um, funding policies that, prom that are positive for ECRs to obtain funding and how other uh, stakeholders and funding organizations can contribute to this. And that brings me to my second point that I think it's really important to start or join a discussion about this topic and to make people aware that this is really important and how early career researchers can benefit from those kind of improvements. And then if you're interested in which funding up, up organizations are actually working towards fair funding opportunities, um, I would uh, encourage you to look at uh, the website of the San Francisco uh, DORA uh, Declaration um, and also at ECR Central, which was another initiative from the ELIF uh, community ambassadors. We've also now indicated which funding organizations are actually have actually signed DORA. So with that, I'm sorry I ran a bit over time. Um, I would like to give the floor back to, to Carolina. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Lottie, for such a nice presentation and all that important information. Um, up next uh, is Hugo Carignano, who performed an independent study on his initiation grants in Argentina, and is also a contributor to eLife Ambassador's Fair Funding Initiative. Uh, Hugo will discuss how initiation grants benefit ECRs in Argentina, and how this may set an example to encourage funding agencies and grant reviewers to open up funding opportunities to a more diverse set of researchers worldwide. Please, Hugo. Thank you, Carolina, for the introduction. Early career researchers are a skilled, energetic, enthusiastic workforce. If well-funded and committed to regional needs, young researchers could be key players and a driving force of Latin American transformation. The prosperity of countries can be visualized as a virtual cycle 
where intensive research in fundamental science, coupled to the translation of novel ideas into innovative products, encourage the economic and social development at large. From the profit obtained by the increase in the gross domestic product, it will be possible to invest a substantial fraction of GDP in new research and therefore perpetuate the cycle. However, which is the current situation in technology intensity and investment in science in Latin countries? Next slide, please. Currently, Latin America economy is primarily based on the exploitation and export of raw materials and natural resources with little or no adoption of technology. Therefore, their economic growth is tied to the fluctuating price of commodities. This situation results in high rise of poverty and social inequity in most of the Latin American countries. For example, the value of manufactured sport as a percentage of merchandise sports are low. Bolivia has the lowest value with only 5%. The average value is around 50% for the region. In contrast, the average value of manufactured sport for a selected group of high income countries is close to 76%. Furthermore, in average, only 8% of the manufactured sport in Latin adopt cutting edge technology. Whereas in high income countries, their average value is 17%. Considering the objective of, sus of sustainable development, the countries of the region have a huge potential to invest in research on priority areas, such as renewable energies, biotechnology applied to agribusiness, information and communication technologies, and preservation of biodiversity. Next slide, please. The fraction of gross product expenditure on research as a percentage of GDP has remained low during the last five years by around 0.5 or less for all Latin American countries, except Brazil, in which is around 1%. Latin American fraction of GDP invested on research is almost two points below of that this time by high income countries. Another particularity of Latin countries is the largest proportion of funds invested on research and development comes from the public sector, government, and university, with a scarce share of 20% from the private sector. This situation is opposed to that found in high income countries, where the share of the private sector represents around 70%. In addition, the public sector not only finances the research, but also carries the work out. On the other hand, in high income countries, research activities are mostly carried out by the private sector. The demonstration that research expenditure is an investment and not an expensive will be an essential step to engage the participation of the private sector in Latin countries. Next slide, please. It is generally accepted that ECR constitute the basis for the development of a competitive and sustainable national research system, since no scientific system can be consolidated without the setting of the young talents of today. In this sense, adequate funding at this early stage is central to stimulate the insertion of these researchers. Thus, promoting the transfer of the knowledge acquired to meet the country's needs. I show Argentina as, as an example, but the situation is in general equivalent in the rest of Latin. In Argentina, the per year amount of an initiation grant is 15 times lower than in the US and almost 10 times less than in Chile and Spain. The difference between Argentina and the US is up to 400 times lower if we compare grants for training researchers, and from two to seven times with respect to Chile, Spain, and Brazil. Currently, there are more than 7,000 Argentine researchers abroad, 
But in this scenario, the incentive to return is very low. The low rate of investment in science is not the only factor that threaten and delay easier scientific progress in Argentina. For example, the time it lasts from the grant applic application until the funds are obtained is around a year and a half, precluding a correct performance at the early stage of the career. A commonly unweighted factor is related to the excessive cost that researchers have to pay for supplies and reagents that are regularly used in the lab. In Argentina, the individual cost of this product doubles the value for which they can be obtained in the US. The same products in Argentina are about 30% more expensive compared to other countries in the same region. No less worrisome is the excessive delay in the delivery of this reaction to the lab. Another high cost is that related to the publication of research results. Currently, the cost of the publication range from $500 to $10,000, meaning that up to 100% of the annual research fund received by, by a researcher can be distinct to this solid item. Paradoxically, Argentina is not among the countries we can regularly apply to editorial discount and waivers. As a whole, this scenario is created where the low financing and high cost restrict the normal functioning of the scientific system. At this crossroad, public policies often encourage researchers to resort to external sources of funding. However, the agendas of international organizations are not necessarily aligned with the domestic needs. Therefore, in order to initiate and sustain an economic filter cycle in Argentina and other Latin countries, it will be necessary that policymakers adopt measures aimed to improve easier funding. In this sense, public funding agencies should prioritize those lines of research that best suit the domestic needs and territorial resources. Considering the current economic context, the development of policies to favor the engagement of the private sector will increase the proportion of GDP destined to research without representing an upman in the government spending. On the other hand, the creation of policies designed to achieve a, re a reduction in taxes and importation time will be generate more equitable conditions in terms of the commercialization and availability of supplies and reaction. Finally, equal and fair mechanisms of scientific result dissemination should be generated by promoting. Thank you for your attention. And thank you, Hugo, for, for such a nice uh, presentation. And we are going to go to our final panelist today. Uh, she's Katie Grogan who leads the Job Application Reviewers Initiative on Future PI Slack. Katie will share how ECRs can empower each other through peer support. Katie, please. Thank you, Carolina. Um, next slide, please. Actually, you can just keep going. Um, so today I'm going to talk about an initiative that I started a couple of years ago that is centered within a group called Future PI Slack. And so Future PI Slack is a crowdsourced peer support and informal mentoring group for, it started for postdocs, but it also includes now a lot of senior graduate students, adjuncts, visiting assistant professors, basically anyone who would like to obtain a job as an independent primary investigator sometime in the future and who has not yet obtained that job. Um, and who's also some within a couple of years of attempting to make that happen. Uh, this group uses the Slack messaging service. It's open to basically everybody. We don't really have any restriction criteria. Um, and you can see on the picture here, there's just, here's some examples of channels of different topics that people talk about. So things like uh, what conferences, advertisements for conferences, does anyone want to collaborate, tips for grants, um, talking about tips for, for acquiring things for lab startup, non-academic careers, et cetera. Um, next slide. 
And within this Future PI Slack group, I started organizing the Future PI reviewing groups. Uh, it's a weekly peer review service for job application materials. Um, so this doesn't directly apply to the discussion about early career funding, but I'm going to come back to how this initiative can be applied to this um, at the very end of this. So first, I'm going to go over what we do and then talk about how this can be applied when it comes to applying for funding. Um, and it's basically, it's open to all Future PI Slack members. So you have to be a member of Future PI Slack to, to participate. It operates annually from August to December. Um, we might be operating into January this year, just because it seems like a lot of advertisements are going, are being posted a lot later. Um, and basically it's a service that reviews anything you might use to apply any kind of job application materials. So uh, people have had their CVs, their cover letters, their statements of research, statements of teaching, statements of diversity, um, and really anything else that you can think of that you might need to, to include in a job application. So why, why do we offer this service? Why did I start this service? Um, the reason that I started it is that is that one of the things I found, uh, Lottie was talking about how postdocs are often in short-term contracts that are frequently moving around, which means that postdocs are often pretty isolated. Most labs don't have more than a couple of postdocs. Those postdocs are generally um, on different timelines. So one might be the, in their first year of a postdoc, the other might be in their fourth year of a postdoc. And so they're going to be going on the job market at different times, which means that it's hard to have a group of people, even within a university, but particularly within a lab or even a department that are all going on the job market at the same time and all need their job market application or their, or their uh, materials to be looked at on the same kind of timeline. Often for postdocs, institutional support is extremely varied. Um, we found, you know, if you've been a postdoc, you're aware that you don't really count as a graduate student, you don't really count as an employee, and you don't really count as a faculty. And so you often tend to slip through the cracks. Um, and even if there is institutional support in the form of, say, an office of postdoctoral education or something like that, what they usually offer are workshops on how to set up your application materials, but they don't offer, they don't often offer a mechanism to actually get feedback on your specific application materials. They, it'll be a two hour workshop on here's how you can set up your research statement, but there's no opportunity necessarily to have anyone take a look at your specific research statement and give you high level or even just, you know, simple grammatical feedback. And so I had been in a previous postdoc position where I was a member of a cohort. I was a member of 10 postdocs that got hired at the same time. And in the program, there were 30 or 40 people. Um, and, and what that meant was that I had a group of people who were all on the same sort of timeline that I was, that I could ask for feedback on documents of any kind and that I could help them. I could also reciprocate, right? I could give them feedback. And so when I moved to my second postdoc, it was in a much smaller position and it occurred to me that I would be going on the job market and that I really wanted more than just the one or two people in my lab or the four or five people in my department to be looking at this, at my job application materials, in particular because the people in my lab are very familiar with the types of work that I do. Whereas a, a, a committee of any kind, either a, a job, you know, a hiring committee or a grant review panel are going to have really disparate expertises. And you, when you're writing anything, whether it be a grant or a job application, then you need to be able to explain your research to a, a wide array of people, a, wide, a, people uh, a group of people with a wide array of expertise. And so having just people in your lab look at your materials doesn't always catch the sort of bigger picture things that are not included that someone who doesn't study exactly what you do might not, might, might not be familiar with. Um, next slide, please. So this service basically operates on a weekly basis. You sign up sometime before Sunday um, because Sunday we send out an email uh, asking people to actually confirm that they're going to participate. Uh, we assign the groups on Monday basically uh, based on who agreed to participate. You then share your materials with your small group, which is usually between two and four people on Monday or Tuesday, whenever you get around to it. 
Other people in your group will share their materials with you. You get a week to review the materials, and then you are supposed to send your comments on their materials back on Friday. Then you take your time to edit your materials, and then you sign up again if you feel like you want your documents to be re-reviewed. And the whole goal of doing it on a Monday to Friday uh, timeline is that if you wanted, say you were on a tight timeline with a deadline coming up, and you wanted to participate in multiple rounds of review, you could spend the weekend editing your stuff and sign up again before the, for the next week. So you could have multiple rounds of turnaround um, with the different people. And I, the groups, I will say, we try to assign group uh, people with very similar goal, like very similar uh, areas of expertise. So um, neuroscience might all be put together, microbiome might all be put together, but, but we try not to make them so specialized that we miss the sort of broader review purpose of this as well. Um, and we also do two to three people so that you aren't overwhelmed, but get a, a fairly broad representation um, of what's happening. Next slide, please. Um, I started this program in the fall of 2018, and since then, um, it, has, it has grown pretty exponentially. Um, we started with just, a, just 20 people over the course of a couple of months. This year so far, we've had almost 80 sign up, and in total, um, the number of unique participants has been nearly 150 people who've done this. Um, on average, the number of people that sign up is in any given week uh, started at around five and now is up to nearly 10 with a... Uh, a max and a min of, of anywhere between three up to uh, almost 20 people in a single week. Um, and the thing that I feel most excited about is that the average number of times that a person participates has increased from two times to three um, with some serious variation there where this year we had a couple of people who participated as many as eight or nine times. Next slide, please. Um, so a couple of the pros, we've talked to some of the participants and some of the things they've talked about were that this actually gives you a really early deadline. You have to get your materials together before your application is due and that helps people with their planning, et cetera. It's also really helpful to see the examples of other people's, uh, how they structure their research statement, et cetera. Um, obviously you get feedback both about the general structure of your application, but also for really specific applications. Like I said, if you have something that's coming up that you're really excited to apply for, this can be a good gut check on, on whether this, this job application is a good fit for this type of thing. Um, we try to organize the group so that the broadness of the peer review expertise is representative of the broadness of the faculty hiring committee. Um, and I've also had anecdotal reports of people connecting with their peers, so with their reviewing groups to then follow up later as they go through the job application process to talk to each other about how well your week is going, how many applications have you put in and basically be really supportive of each other. Um, and I've heard that's been really helpful. There's a couple of potential cons for participating in something like this. Um, obviously, like with any kind of peer review, I guess there's the potential for being scooped, but because our expertises are so are often so disparate, that's it's a very rare, I, I haven't heard of that happening um, and I don't expect it being a problem. And then, you know, if you're a particularly competitive person, I guess you're unfortunately increasing the quality of your competition, but um, I think it also increases your, the quality of your own materials. So it's worth it. Um, next slide, please. Um, and one of the things that I think uh, what I asked me to talk about this was that was that this has worked really well for job application materials, but I could see this working as an extremely effective program for reviewing grants. Um, anecdotally, I've had some people tell me that they actually started their own reviewing groups for things like applying for NIH R21s or for um, NIH postdoc fellowships, things like that. Um, and I think that that could be, this could be a really good model for that kind of thing. It's actually been done before. Um, here in the U.S., we have um, the, and I forget what this, this stands for, but um, the NRMN, which is basically the National Mentoring Network, actually has a proposal preparation program that is about four months long that involves multiple rounds of peer review uh, within this people who've signed up for this program. And so there are instances of this happening in other places. Um, and then there's a paper by Coolidge et al. where uh, a university implemented this for actually manuscript peer reviewing um, to, to look at sort of the broadness of the, of the potential reviewers. Next slide, please. 
And so if you wanted to join and you were interested in doing this, we'll be doing this for at least a few more weeks. Uh, you can either go to this website to and click the join button and uh, send an email to the person who organizes it, Pearl, or you can just send me an email and request an invitation. And if you want to join the reviewing groups program, the channel is job app reviewers and the sign up sheet, uh, the Google sign up sheet is pinned to the top of that channel. And I think I'm done there. Next slide. Thank you, Katie. That was very interesting. Um, thank you to all uh, to our speakers. Uh, we now invite you all to ask questions to the panelists. Uh, you can type a question in the question box here in the chat, or tweet us questions on Twitter uh, to at eLife Community using the hashtag ECR Wednesdays. Uh, we do have a couple of questions now. Um, there is one question for Hugo. It says, what criteria do journals use to decide what individuals or countries can apply for editorial discounts and or waivers? Okay, uh, I am not sure because different journals have different lists. So what is the criteria? I, I, I don't know. Uh, uh, I think it is a, a, um, maybe a, we have a range of where foreign debt in the past. So maybe that uh, qualify the country externally and the journal see our country as a, a high income countries, but that, that is not true. I, I think, uh, I don't know why, but uh, different journals have different lists of countries, so I don't know. Yeah, it's different to make it general, maybe. <laughs> yeah, and uh, there is another question for you. It says, governments of uh, Latin American countries invest more in R&D than business enterprises compared to high income countries. Do you know why? I think it will be because uh, we don't have uh, a venture capital system estab established in our country. Maybe our enterprise uh, don't, don't, don't put risks in, in, uh, in, in their investment. I suppose uh, because science is a high risk investment, maybe uh, they go to the uh, to the secure uh, investment. Yeah, it's true. And I, I actually have a question related to that because what, what do you think is a, is a more important strategy for a developing country? Do you think it's more important for, for, for the government to try to invest more of the GDP directly on R&D or invest more in motivating the private sector to increase the investment on R&D? What, what do you think could work better? Definitely, I think we need more private sector to get uh, engaged with the research and development. Uh, because right now uh, we have an economic crisis due to, well, now for the pandemic situation, but we, we can't uh, charge more to the government with the necessity to spend money in research. We need to the private sector. Yeah, particularly in these times. Huh? Yes. Um, there is a question for Katie. Um, job application systems can be very different per country continent. Is it suitable for applicants at non-US institutions to join your initiative? So we've actually had a lot of people who are applying for non-US institutions participate in the initiative. And the only thing we ask is that um, you provide guidelines to your reviewers as to what the differences are. Um, and we, we do occasionally try to group people based on what the different uh, types of institutions they're applying for, but we, we sort of have prioritized a grouping people based on expertise. 
so that you don't have someone who's so far afield that they really aren't able to help with the science. Um, it's a little easier. I find that we are all as academics so used to looking at different rules and regulations like Google was talking about with every journal has its own set of criteria. Every uh, application has its own set of criteria. Every grant application looks different. That it's easier to, to, be, to share how the um, applications to non-US institutions differ from US institutions than it is to try to uh, share wildly disparate expertises. So um, yeah, we've had a lot of people who apply for, who are applying for non-US institutions participate. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, there is another question for you. It says, if people want to start a similar initiative within their own community, do you have guidelines or other materials available? I am so glad you asked this question because we are in the middle of uh, writing a paper about this, actually, a paper to describe how this initiative works and to talk about the types of participants we've had, the number of participants, and also um, to actually do some surveys of the people who participated to get their feelings on whether it worked well, what could be improved, et cetera. Um, and we're hoping to have a paper put together by next summer or so that should describe exactly how this works so that people can start their own initiatives. If someone is interested in starting this beforehand, you are welcome to get in touch with me and I'm happy to provide a uh, more of a set of written guidelines for what we've done, or even just to sit down and chat and tell you what we've done and how it's working and why we do uh, specific things the way that mm -hmm. we do them. Um, yeah, happy to share, but yes, uh, look for a paper on this. Um, I'm a little behind Hugo and, and Claudia on, on getting the paper together. So look in about six months. <laughs> Thank you. Looking forward for, for that paper too. There is a last uh, question for you. It says, there have been, that, no, have there been instances within future PI Slack job application review that has given rise to collaborative research projects securing funding? Ooh, I don't know of any anecdotally off the top of my head. However, uh, that is one of the questions that we are including in the survey that we should be sending out to the participants to ask them what were the pros, what were the cons. Um, and so hopefully if someone, if that has happened, someone will tell us. Um, yeah, I don't, mostly I only hear from the people who are not yet have not yet secured a position. And so they are usually not in an easy place where they can start applying for funding. Um, but we have now had several cohorts of this. And so hopefully the people who participated in 2018, it's possible that they then went on to, to write collaborative grants with people they, they uh, reviewed with. Okay, nice. Uh, there is now a question for Lottie, uh, it says, do you see differences between the importance of ECR funding for landing a job depending on the country? Do some countries, I'm guessing the US, for example, give more importance to having funding? Um, yes, well, we, we don't know for all countries. Uh, I mean, we, we haven't done a meta research analysis on that also because it's difficult to get all the information also on how much funding each country gives uh, or has for early career researchers. Um, so um, that was actually also one of our recommendations as well, like to, to be more transparent and to, to be more open about that as a country or as funding organization. Um, but to come back to your question, uh, we have found only one paper that has analyzed that and that was um, for US uh, grants, uh, where they found that it was not a prerequisite to, to obtain a job to get a, to get a, a faculty position when, uh, yeah, to, you don't need to have the funding, but if you have had independent funding before, for example, for your postdoc, um, it, was, it was an advantage, a, a big advantage to get the faculty position. And, 
I think from my own feeling and experience, um, it, it is, it is an, an, an important thing. And maybe even, it doesn't need to be a very big fellowship, but I'm actually always telling people like, even if you can apply for a travel grant to go to a conference or to visit a lab, uh, even if it's just in the neighbor country, um, it, it shows some independence from your supervisor and it shows that you, yeah, that you are driven to, to get some money to, to pursue your goals within your academic uh, career. So I think it's, it's also an important personal development to even if you have the opportunity to apply for some small fundings. Can I, I'm going to break in here for Lottie. Um, <laughs> yes. I actually, so I applied for a lot of the smaller grants as a graduate student. And when I got a fellowship as a postdoc, that was mentioned in the reviews that it wasn't a lot of money, but there was the comment was that I had shown, uh, I had shown my ability to get funding. And that actually was one of the stronger points of candidacy. So I'm, I'm with Lottie on, Lottie on, on, even the small stuff can really help. Like they made us, reviewers made a specific point that having had previous funding, I was a good candidate for new funding. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and now invite our panelists to offer some closing remarks. I will start. Um, yeah, I hope that all the attendees have, have, have enjoy today but also that you've learned something and that we uh, have inspired you uh, to to think more about this topic and to maybe pursue uh, some of your goals and and for my my part where I, what I've presented um, I think it's really important that we as early career researchers together stand for for what we want and that we we will be the driving force to to drive change uh, because more senior academics or funding organizations may not be in the field and they, 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 they are not the early career researchers. So I think we, if we want change, we should, uh, yeah, really actively pursue uh, and start a discussion um, with, with people around you uh, and with funding organizations if you have contacts there. So that's something I would like to take you to take away from today. Thank you, Lottie. Also, there is a final question for you. It says, uh, when researching the fairness of grants, did you get feedback from funders or heard of plans to improve accessibility? Um, we, have, we have tried to contact funders, but it's also difficult. Um, however, there are luckily funding organizations, uh, not all of them, but some of them are really working towards a better research culture. I think the biggest example I know uh, also because I did my postdoc in London is the Wellcome Trust and, and they are really working towards this, but also more and more uh, uh, societies and funding organizations are really are really looking to, to change the system because they, they also see that, that we're stuck in this. Um, so we, we haven't gotten like direct feedback if they will do something with us. Uh, we're also like actively approaching funders. So hopefully that will, that will help in this discussion and improving change. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> Hugo, uh, uh, is there anything else that you want to add? We, we can't hear you. Sorry, sorry. Uh... I would like to encourage to shun investigators to get involved with uh, scientific policies. Uh, I think we need, we need them to improve our system. Uh, I think we, we, we need voices, different voices, and get involved with policymakers and, and make the cut discussion. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Katie. Yeah, I would second Lottie's point that uh, we are all examples of early career researchers who saw a whole, a lack of support in something that we felt was important or a hole in the research on the science of doing science, 
right, of being a scientist. Um, and I would encourage everybody who's attending that if, if there is a hole that you feel needs to be plugged or you are upset that there isn't this particular support mechanism for you, that some things can be initiated by yourself with a lot of, with very little effort um, and can have huge returns. When I started this reviewing program, it was me and 20 people and it took about 20 minutes a week. And now it's big enough that there's nearly a hundred people so far. I've got a, a team of organizers that are helping me. We're writing a paper, et cetera. Like, so you can, we, we, and with thought it's, it's up to us to change the system. If you see a thing that you want to do that helps yourself and others, um, I say go for it. Uh, I know it takes a little bit of time, but it can often have huge dividends down the road. And I think that it's with a lot of the technology that's available, we as a group are innovating uh, in some really amazing and astounding ways. And that could be you too. Thank you, Katie. You're right. Uh, we have to be involved. <laughs> And yeah, if you enjoyed today's webinar, the ECR Wednesday webinar series will recommence on 2021 and we hope you will join us then. Uh, but for now, um, I would like to say thank you to our speakers and to everyone who tuned in today and contribute to the discussion. It was a great opportunity to hear these unique perspectives uh, on a complex topic and we hope you feel empowered to join the discussion and thank you very much.